Hello, 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 and welcome to the live stream happy hour. I'm trying to get some music to stop real quick. Oh, awkward start, but right on time. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Eric Raymond. I'm the host of the live stream happy hour. I'm also the arts education program manager with Lane Arts Council. And I am so excited to welcome our very special guest today, Mara Tigerson. Mara, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Eric. I'm yes, looking forward absolutely. to it. I'm so excited to learn more about the incredible plain air painting work that you've been doing and the watercolor arts that you that you create. We get to see a few of those later today. But I'm going to start us off with just getting through this beginning kind of welcome and introduction for everyone who's tuning sure. in. So yeah. for those who are tuning in, welcome. This is the live stream happy hour. We started this over a year ago around the time that the pandemic was first breaking out as a way for artists to continue to connect with audiences here in Lane County, as well as for audiences to learn about new artists. So for being here, thank you for helping make that mission of bringing artists and community together for these happy hours. Um, this is also a really great opportunity to remind you of the incredible value of the arts. Um, the arts make us, bring us alive, they help us process, and they help us come together. And it's important that we all contribute to the arts here in our community. So I would like to formally ask all of you who are watching today to please go and make a financial or meaningful contribution to an arts organization you care very deeply about. Lane Arts Council might be that organization or maybe another in the community. Whatever one you care about, we encourage you to go make a contribution there. And you know that folks that donate to one organization often donate to multiple organizations. So you have to make that first donation, please head over to another arts organization or civil rights organization and make a contribution there as well. It takes all of us coming together to keep the arts alive. So thank you for your support of the arts through this wonderful time that we're all living through that is making us grow, making us stronger, and making us more united as we continue to work together to process all the things that are going on in our world. So anyway, thank you for being here. We're so appreciative of that. Enough of that. Let's get in and learn a little bit more about Mara. So Mara, tell us a little bit about your personal art form and art practice. Well, uh, first of all, I, I do watercolors, and the re and um, we talked about this earlier. The reason I started, I started and then kept up with watercolors. You know, I have four sons. I had a whole bunch of these kids, and I needed to be able to um, set up quick and clean up quick. And mm -hmm. then also uh, in nineteen, I think it was nineteen, the summer of nineteen eighty six. I took Ralph Baker's watercolor class uh, the mm -hmm. summer of uh, yeah 1986 at the University of Oregon, and um, it just it was the most exciting thing that I had that had ever happened practically because mm -hmm. I could combine my love of nature and painting, and uh, I like to you know I my preference is to have a big heavy pack and hike long distances looking for the most sublime, you know, exotic, beautiful uh, landscape that will intoxicate me enough to to do all the work. And then some, and then the other reason about the watercolors is that again, out in nature, there's been times when I've heard a warning in my ear, like, you know, like when I'm way far out there. And I mean, that was before I had these wolf dogs that, you know, make me feel really safe. But I would hear that I would get this notification, so to speak, telepathically, danger clean up get out now and then i would mm -hmm. and so it was like whoosh, 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 really fast to clean up so that's how i got into the watercolors but my process i'd say so i hike until i find a place that i really feel a connection with and then i'd like to spend two three four hours and sometimes go back at the same time of day mm -hmm. and the first thing i do is i um I do a bunch of thumbnail sketches working on the, the composition to have a balanced composition. I work out all, I try to work out all the problems ahead of time. And then when I feel like I've really got it and I know what my, my focal point is and where I'm going to have my, my macho dark and my, and my macho light white, uh, then I feel more confident to just start to just paint. And I, I'm because of the air and the, the the light changing, I have to paint very, very fast, especially mm -hmm. water. 
And then um, what I try to do is to stop while I still have options. I learned that from Amberto Gonzalez when I took a workshop with him. So then I'll, so I'll stop and I bring it home and then I work very slowly, very, very slowly. And I, I enjoy both processes. I mean, a lot of times when I'm painting out nature, I think, God, this is totally horrible. This is so crappy and terrible and I hate it. And then, I mean, God, what a waste of time. What a loser, you know? And, yeah. and then I set it up and then I start to see some, you know, oh, well, there's a possibility. And I've had several mm -hmm. painter friends rescue paintings that I was going to throw in the trash and they'd say like no wait look all you have to do is scrub out that emphasis that and then I go really and then I do it I go oh wow they were right so I've learned mm -hmm. that I am not the best judge of my work mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I do enjoy that the, the process yeah. yeah well I love hearing a little bit more about how the um the process works for plein air painting because I think that sometimes there's a misconception that plein air painting is you go out and you paint on site until your painting is complete. But it's really a lot more about making sure you get out to that location, make sure you document the inspiration that you're taking in in that moment, and that there can be this finishing process that happens when you come home. That it's right. not always something that has to happen right there on site. Um, yeah. But it's something that is about the inspiration and being there present with the inspiration is something that I hear in, in that. Is that true? Oh, abs absolutely. Absolutely. And I do enjoy the process of slowly working on There have been some paintings where I bring them home. Something's wrong. I don't know what it is. And sometimes I've had paintings that have been up on my wall for a couple of years. Seriously. Wow. And then all of a mm -hmm. sudden, one day I'll go and go, oh, and I know what to do. And so I, I've really learned to value that process. And when I get into too much of a hurry, you know, especially when you're painting on scene, I try to, to re hold back a little bit because the tendency is to just want to, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a very, uh, so I like both that very uh, spontaneous, very emotional reaction to the, to the, to the scene that you're seeing. And then I also enjoy the thoughtful, slow process and sometimes I'll do I'll I'll paint little things like maybe this need this cliff needs to be brought out here and paint it exactly and then you know kind of tape it so that you can't see the tape on the painting go oh no that's the wrong that's the wrong size okay let's so I do stuff like that. I, I do think I mean eventually I want to get into oils but I, I love the translucency of of uh watercolors and the the challenge and Ralph Baker, uh, the, my professor at the University of Oregon, he used to say, for every 30 watercolors, you'll have 29 failures and one success. And that was actually mm. helpful. And then mm. Eric Sandgren, another another wonderful uh, teacher, he, he has a paint out every summer on the coast the whole in July. It's a wonderful thing. He had two weeks where we're in different locations. And he said, no, I think that for every 100 watercolors, 99 failures one success if you get better than that you're doing really good so it's a, it's a it watercolor humbles you it is the yeah. most difficult of all the painting mm -hmm. mediums and maybe that's part of why i like it is, is is the challenge it's like it's like make it or break it yeah well let's maybe let's let's check out some of your art so we've got some examples sure. here right from your website so um okay. let's click through a couple of these and kind of see uh well, for uh, example, tell bit, yeah, tell me a little bit this, about this one right here to the top left. Yeah, yeah, Depot Bay. Now, this one, uh, I was with I was with the 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 Sandgren painters, and I didn't want to be at the, anyhow. I went and found this place myself. The first day I was there painting, it was a total failure. It was like the most horrible painting you can imagine. So I brought it back to to my hotel room. I studied the composition. I spent hours and hours and hours f trying to figure out why this painting was was garbage, you know, was trash. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I, I feel it I, with all that time I spent. And the next day I went back and I knew that I wanted to make I wanted to really emphasize the, um, you know, the cave where you can see the other side of the, the water. So I, I was mm -hmm. pretty, I was pretty pleased with it. And um 
Yeah. So that, yeah, that, and then, and then this one right here, Agate Beach, Big Waves, mm -hmm. Bolinas. I was pretty warm. I go to Bolinas usually every summer for two weeks to paint mm -hmm. landscapes. And, you know, I, I, it's a beautiful, beautiful place mm -hmm. in California. And I was confident enough that I was warmed up. So I just set my easel right there on the sand and just painted really big. And, you know, I'm, I mean, there's still things that bother me about it, but uh, mm -hmm. it was it was a really good positive experience. Yeah. Well, this example of Depot Bay, uh, so much detail included in this painting. It's really quite incredible. And, and being somebody who has worked with watercolor, that's a really difficult thing to get to be able to make sure you can control the way that the water, the paints are being distributed from these bleeds that are happening down here to these very clean lines that are happening over here. Um, yeah. It's a wonderful example of, of the way that you have really mastered this particular uh, medium. So was that kind of part of the challenge that came with this one was trying to find the ways to make sure that the bleed and the clean lines kind of found the right. Yeah. It's, Right. It's like the, the balance of soft, soft, soft edges, hard edges. Mm -hmm. And if you have it all hard, it's just, you know, it's, you know, that's, I mean, when I look at my old paintings, I just, I just, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. You have to, it's a, it's a, a real cognitive thing in a lot of ways. You have to really be thinking. And that's why when people uh, come up and try to talk to me when I'm, pa I'm painting, I don't, I won't talk to them because mm -hmm. my brain, it's like every second I'm making 15 decisions. Mm -hmm. you know? and, so you, and so that's all I can focus on. As far as a therapy for escaping all your problems, I highly <laughs> recommend it because when you're doing watercolor, you really, there's no room in your head for, for whatever mm -hmm. you're feeling neurotic and anxious about. There's just mm -hmm. no room because you're, you're just, it's you're completely caught up in it. In fact, a friend yeah. made, made me a sign that said that I can sometimes put behind me, please do not disturb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's real. And, and you know, I, I, I hear that this idea of being able to really get in one with the medium that you're working with that flow state, it sounds like you really access when you're working with the medium of really getting into the state of your of being in relationship to the object. And I think sometimes that's something that is forgotten about the visual art form is how many visual artists really find that relationship with the medium that when you're working to make it look in a particular way or manipulate it in particular ways or really find a relationship because watercolor also sometimes tells you what it wants to do <laughs> and so right. well, you know, and, to be able yeah. to relationship with it like that mm -hmm. and and i and there's a lot of paintings where i just let it do what it wants to do and then, mm -hmm. and then, and then I come back in later, and I maybe shape it or or put a little bit more form. I've also sadly ruined several paintings that started out so spontaneous, so fresh, you know, um, soft edges, and then I came in and completely killed it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with hard edges and making it too dark, and you know, yeah. all that type I've of stuff. There. And yeah. I relate to that very deeply. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. you know the you know the painter Adam Grosowski. Mm -hmm. So I took the he's a, he's a, he's an incredible teacher as well as an incredible artist. Mm -hmm. And I took this class from him, and he would yell at me across the studio. He'd say, "Tigerson, stop now!" You know, and I go. And I'm so grateful. I wish that I try to be that voice in myself, like stop now. Yeah before you ruin it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because watercolor especially can be really lost. If you lose all of your white space on the page, Right, it becomes a really big bleeding mess. And that's something that sometimes I think is a misconception about watercolor is that there's this feeling that you need to cover every inch, but actually these little pockets that you have that are um, very light in here, right, in the clouds, that adds such incredible depth in here, or this wonderful white, whiter i should say kind of colors down here with the waves it, it gives the texture and you can't get white back very easily in watercolor unless yeah. you're incorporating gouache into the mix and so it really does become something that requires that 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 discipline to stop and that's a yeah. really hard thing to, uh, often to do yeah mm -hmm. yeah. It, yeah it's a very humbling experience but the, the thing that i try to cheer my because i've had a lot of failures and disasters but what cheers me is that I've had this, ex this sublime experience for two, three, sometimes four hours 
of just being intoxicated in this beautiful mm -hmm. place and you just become you know like my my fingers my brushes my eyes i are one with the sky the you know uh the, the sea the lake it's like you know it's it's a it's a real it's a you know satori it's a it's a really so i try to comfort myself with yeah that was a really bad painting but you had a really great time and then some of them like the, i i was painting today with the plain air painters of lane county and even though the painting's not a success, I was so excited by the scene that I found that I can't wait to go mm -hmm. back there. I'm going to keep going back there at the same time of day until I get it. And that's what it. Monet did in a lot of the impressionists. They did that. They went back to this. They'd go to the same scene in different seasons, mm -hmm. uh, time of day. And sometimes like when I would be in Bellinas carrying all these boards and stuff, I'd feel like I was like a doctor making my rounds. Okay, I'd go to this scene because this is where I'd been at mm -hmm. eight o'clock yesterday morning. And then I, oh, got to get going and go over to the scene. It's at 1030. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I had to remember to pack food for myself so I wouldn't get too lightheaded. But it's wow. also great exercise having to, to walk all over and get you know with these heavy packs yeah well this is great this is a great lead into one of my questions that i have for you is is adventure is very clearly an important part of your art making experience so tell me a little bit of how adventure and art making come together for you in this process well, first i'll tell you i'll, I'll tell you my that. most recent my most recent uh well one of my biggest recent adventures uh i go camping alone uh, at the end of su uh, every every at the at the end in after Labor Day when it, it's mm -hmm. not so crowded with first my first wolf dog and then my second wolf dog, so mm -hmm. I go out there September seventh of two thousand twenty. Mm -hmm. Wait, was it two thousand twenty? Yeah, and uh, I noticed that it was very windy, and it had never been windy like that. And also, mm -hmm. I'm technologically challenged, so. It took me a long time to set up the tent, get the Coleman stove working, all that stuff. You know, setting up a tent by yourself is a lot different than having another person do it. So mm -hmm. I, you know, took this wonderful hike with Lila. And then uh, anyhow, it was, it was bl blowing like crazy. And the camp host comes up, I was, uh, up to me as, you know, plates and stuff were flying off into the, you know, and he said, uh, I just, five sets of campers have just left uh, because, and I, I would encourage you to leave because there are winds 60 to 70 miles per hour for tonight. This was before they knew about the fire. So oh. my adventure was, I thought, well, God damn it. You know, I brought all this stuff. I got all my painting supplies. I know exactly where I want to paint because I have so many favorite mm -hmm. places. So I decided to stay even though, and I secured the tent with, you know, having uh, heavy things, the big cooler, the stove, uh, Lila. And, uh, and I was a little worried about, you know, I had a very frail, one of those cheap, frail tents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and blow off something. <laughs> And uh, and and I, it did occur to me that trees could fall down on me and big heavy branches. But I quickly made the decision that the the least amount of energy would be to stay calm, and that being afraid mm -hmm. would take up too much energy. Mm -hmm. So and in the and so it was an incredible night. It was mm -hmm. almost like I know you haven't ever given birth or anything, but it was it was kind of like contractions. You have these really hard contractions when the wind is just blowing. I mean, it just like blew my tent all the way in, and then oh it, and then it would recede. And I also had to be calm because Lila at first was trying to attack the wind. But so anyhow, my point is, and then the next morning we got up. I mean, we obviously we survived and um, went on a long hike. And there were all these trees that had fallen down and branches. And, you know, and I was, you know, getting ready to set up my painting. And Campos comes by and says, you're evacuated. You need to leave right now. And I said, oh, oh I'll, I'll just I'll just drive back to Eugene. He said, no, you can't drive back to Eugene because there's fire right in the middle of the road in Vida and Lieberg and, you know, oh, Blue River. So, so that was quite an adventure. And I, and, but I felt so kind of ripped off that I didn't get to have my three days and nights of painting and being alone. And it's kind of like dangerous levels of bliss. So that's one, that's one adventure. And I hope to, 
correct that one with I've got a I'm going to be there again in September. Uh, other mm -hmm. adventures. Um, so the, there's the, the I like to paint in all kinds of weather. I've painted mm -hmm. in rain, which you know definitely does change the watercolor, and sometimes it has some interesting effects. I've painted in really severe cold, like I told you the other day. There was a time I was painting in Hendricks Park, I think it was in November, and I had just mm -hmm. bought this new, very expensive brush, and all of a sudden, I, it wasn't working. It, it, was, it wasn't moving, and then I discovered, oh, that's because your hand's frozen, you know, and I kind of, I trip out on that because I think that's so neat that mm -hmm. I was not aware that it was that cold that, you know, that it had frozen mm -hmm. my hand and that's why the brush wasn't moving. And um, so, and then also uh, in the uh, painting on the beach, mm -hmm. there's wind storms and I got used to having, I have a lot of sand encrusted paintings. And I think, <laughs> and I think that kind of adds something to the whole, the painting, it gives it more mm -hmm. texture. You know, so you could either be really upset. Oh my goodness, get, get that sand away. But you know, it's just gonna keep coming back. And then same thing when you're painting on the ocean, like on a cliff, I've had the experience of the easel sailing off into the bright blue yonder. And I just <laughs> ramble after it thinking, what an idiot, you know, but I, and then I set it up, start painting again, then it blows off again. And <laughs> I, I just laugh at myself because, you know, a sane person would just say, well, you know, the, the wind is giving you a message to pack up and go, but no, I am not satisfied. I'm still working on that scene. I got to figure out how to do the waves. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and then I used to in the summers, you know, when it's really hot, I came up with the scene. I'd ride my bike wearing really old, horrible clothes, shorts and T-shirts, have my bike all outfitted with my board, all, all my equipment. And I would just ride around, find a scene, paint it, uh, go swimming, and then get on my bike. And I would, and so one time when I was doing this, it was down uh, right before you get into Springfield on the Willamette River. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. by that big bridge, that big mm -hmm. bridge. And I, I parked my bike and there was all this overgrown foliage. And I went out, I knew it was kind of a dangerous thing to do, but it was like the view was magnificent. So I got out this little promontory. I'm sitting down there painting. I'm completely entranced. I'm, and I'm, I'm in a very intense state of mind because I'd mixed up pools of like five, six different colors for the water because I was going to have to paint it super fast and have it all mixed. All mm -hmm. of a sudden, this uh, bare-chested homeless man just jumps out of the bushes at me. And this is where having a bad temper comes in handy. And I, plus, you know, I was really, I mean, I was in a very intense, and I just went, Hush! you know, I did this whole, and he jumped backwards. I was just like, how dare you? you know, like that. And, then, and he just, I mean, it just, it was like I, like a wind had just blown him backwards. But then of mm -hmm. course I was, Oh my God, you know, that's, that was really mm -hmm. scary. And I lost a brush, went sailing down the Willamette, but I packed up really quick, got on my bike and, you know, so I've had a, a lot of those kinds of adventures too. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about that anymore with having, you know, a wolf dog with me. Mm -hmm. So that's uh yeah, no, it's it's a I I just I love the physical challenge of mm -hmm. dealing with all these different weather situations, and I will confess it is nice too to then come home to a nice warm studio where nobody's mm -hmm. going to be popping out of the bushes or anything. Yeah, yeah, but you know you know who's in your surroundings at least. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I I love hearing this idea of how the environment really becomes a part of the painting, whether that's the way that the paint brush may have brushed across the, the canvas as it was flying away or it, yeah. it, it rains the scrap sand literally in there. Um, you know, there's, there's a, this relationship that exists that I think is sometimes, um, it, it may not be explicitly seen in it, but it's something that you know that's in your art, right? That, that is held in that piece and, and things like sand, you might be able to see explicitly in it as, as an audience member. But to be able to hear your relationship and your stories connected to these pieces, it deepens what the representation of a landscape might mean. Because it's not just the landscape you're representing, it's the adventure that you're representing. It's 
this human to nature connection that's happening in that piece. It, it nature having its way, right? That that's a really exciting thing. And I love your quote about like the wind would be, would be telling other people to go away, but I guess the other side of it is the wind was challenging to see if you were worthy of capturing this image, right? Or this yeah. moment. And yeah. I think there's something really powerful in that kind of idea of relationship to resilience that, that mm -hmm. comes with this. And to have something so delicate like watercolor have these stories of <laughs> incredible adventure and, and adversity um, is really exciting in those pieces. So I, I love hearing that kind of context that you, that you carry with you in your process. Yeah, well, I yeah, thank you, thank you, Eric, and I just I just enjoy the whole thing. Although I have to share with the people out out there listening, there is also a lot of anxiety when I first mm -hmm. start a painting. It's like, and if I haven't painted, like if I'm warmed up and I've been painting five hours a day, I'm good. But if I haven't painted for a couple of weeks, or you know. It's it's really scary, and that's why I don't want anybody coming in and coming up to me and saying, "Are you painting? Are yeah. you in the class? You know, <laughs> can I watch? You know." So I mean, there is anxiety, and so I think that for me, the physicality of everything it just kind of helps push me through. Like, yeah, it looks pretty sloppy right now, but let's just keep going. You know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I can imagine that distraction being being very hard when you have to try and be like when a social interaction suddenly pops up when you're in your flow state. You know, I know so many artists that specifically have studios in order to be able to really zone in and really have their environment that they create for how they're how they're going to create their art so they have the yeah. right music on they've got the right lighting going up they've got the right yeah. items surrounding them you know they invite the right people into the room potentially and you're in a space where there is so much more uncertainty that it's not just the environment it's also the humans of that environment that sometimes who can be so and who can be the, you know what was that yeah the, the humans can be very annoying i mean i feel for them sometimes i've said uh well i've said you know i really can't talk i need to concentrate but you're welcome to come back in an hour or an hour and a half when i've finished and i did that one time in hendrick's park and this older white man he had some severe umbrage with that he said i have a right to do, 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 do. so i mean i've run into some how do you say this nicely semi completely unpleasant people mm -hmm. yeah but that's that's our world that we live in. Sometimes we we aren't in the same sphere of understanding when we're trying to go about our days. Well, we got to see a little bit of some of the pictures of the ocean. Let's check a couple of your examples sure. of what's like more placid riverside locations. So tell yeah. us a little bit about these pieces right here. Well, now I for a lot of these I I totally forgot I had these because I have had them sort of locked away. This one right here, which is called a uh, white trunk coast fork of Willamette River. Uh, this is right near, I'm not going to tell you where it is because I don't want everybody going there, but I have bushwhacked for the past, I think, 13 years. I found this wonderful place in South Pisgah where I don't see any humans. I can be there all day long. And, I, and I've and i got uh, my little meditation grove right on a bluff right over the river. So this, I just walked down a little bit further from my, where I bushwhacked and um, just had this wonderful experience of, of painting. But the, the original painting I did there was much smaller. And then I, when I came home, I made it full, you know, full size. Same thing, mm -hmm. this, this one, this is right around, this is right around where that man popped out of the foliage. Mm -hmm. um, but I love the tranquility of, of the water and the stillness, which is also why I love Clear Lake so much too. I mean, the ocean is, really demanding it's just mm -hmm. so it's just it's so never, it never settles for you right no uh, one of the one of my paintings i didn't get it um i did not get it put up on my website yet but it's called uh yahat's ocean chaos and i was painting right into the i did the whole painting in 25 minutes and i was wow. blind the whole time i was painting into the sun and but again i had the intelligence at that time to stop after 25 minutes and it's it's i'm sorry that i don't have it here to to show you guys but um it, look at the website in a couple of days it'll it'll be up it it did it, it's sold though but it's um and i i love those experiences too where you can't see what the hell you're doing but you're just mm -hmm. doing it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I really love, especially looking at that last one there, even comparing the water right here with this foliage right here, there's similar techniques in many ways that can be seen with the ways that you create soft edges, but there is this distinctly different character that exists right here and the way that the shadows play than the way that the shadows play here in the water. It's, it's right. really amazing to see how these techniques can be with a very with intentional finesse really yeah. adjusted to capture the way that light works in these different places. Tell me a little bit about how you how you consider light and how you think about light specifically kind of in your work as you're painting. Well, I, light is the most important thing to me. Mm -hmm. And I try to uh, ca that's why, I mean, Adam Grosowski got me to leave much bigger areas of white in the painting. And um, I, you know, it's such a, almost like a mystical thing. I don't really know how to explain it. You know, it's sort of like this instinctual thing, but I try, mm -hmm. that's why I try to be not to go in too fast and too heavy so that I save all of those white areas. And I do, bef and this is where good drawings, good thumbnail sketches really comes in handy because you can work out and say, okay, this whole section, I'm going to make that, I'm going to leave that white and very, and have very little else in it, maybe some little tints of color and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and Ralph Baker used to say, better to spend 100 hours sketching and resketching, working out the composition and just one hour of painting, then the reverse to only sketch for an hour and then paint for a hundred hours. Wait. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I, I learned the hard way on that one. He, he'd come by, we painted in the graveyard at the, the U of O during the day. And my, uh, my painting was a total, <laughs> And I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And he just sat down and he and he just showed me how to rework the composition, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of it is just the patience. It sometimes it takes a long time before you you really you know, and then before you really know what you want to accomplish, you have to. Mm -hmm. It's a, it, it's almost intellectual, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love hearing that. That's so wonderful to hear. And, it, and it's interesting. I'm going to kind of bring us over to another question that you keep talking about all these wonderful educators that you've learned from. Yet you have a story that is very away from that story of, of educators in art. So you oh. dropped you dropped your art major when you were in your undergrad. You originally went for art. Tell me a little bit about that story of dropping your art major and how did it change your artistic journey? Well, uh, yeah, it was at UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And David Korn was the visiting artist, and the whole program was all about abstract expressionism, which just didn't do anything for me. And mm -hmm. all of my, like, for example, uh, I I, later on I'm going to add all my figures, naked people, in my in my uh, in my web page website. Um, so, like, I would I did these. I still think they're just beautiful life drawings that I did, and. Mm -hmm full of emotion and, you know, and, and really good, you know, good proportion and, and very passionate and all that. And I got straight C's and then people who just did these, you know, uh, you know, like I remember there was this one painting, it was a big lime green painting, all lime green flat with a streak of orange. And the professor went on about that for like hours and hours and my giant painting, anyhow, uh, I, I was doing so. It, I so I got so frustrated with not feeling that I was my work was at all valued or appreciated. Mm -hmm. So then mm -hmm. I joined. I I dropped the major and went into Marxist criminology department at UC Berkeley, where there was more creativity with political cartoons, and mm -hmm. uh, and I'd had this uh, dream for a long time of doing art therapy with juvenile delinquents. So mm -hmm. I did. I got a. I I finagled a really wonderful internship with um, Skip Skeen, who was uh, this juvenile probation officer, and there was an art therapist in Contra Costa. I was you know living in Berkeley at Contra Costa and I got trained in art therapy and it was really great. So I had these Friday workshops, kids would come in that were working off court hours for burglary and all kinds of yummy stuff like that. And it was just fascinating what mm -hmm. I 
learned from these kids and how I was able to to help them really explore, you know, the darkness and and uh, that those tools I learned in art therapy have really helped helped me a lot. Like uh, there's a little short story. I was working, I think it was 1989. I was working at uh, Looking Glass when Looking Glass was just one place on River Road. And I had been doing this art therapy with these kids. I'd have them draw a tree with these certain certain instructions about thinking about all this stuff. And then I would be able to privately, I, I mean, it was just amazing when I could pull out. So there, anyhow, one time the staff, they were having problems with a parent who was being disruptive and not, mm. and interfering with the counseling with the kid and all that. And they said, could you please take, you know, Nancy off and do some art therapy with her. So I had her draw this tree and she was like, I don't know, I think she was like 40 years old or something. Mm -hmm. And I noticed at a certain point in the trunk, there was like a big wound. And I said, it looks like it, it looked like when she was about six, seven years old. And I said, mm -hmm. something really traumatic happened to you when you were six or seven years old. Can you tell me about that? And she said, no, I don't remember. And then two days later, she called me at Looking Glass and she said something terrible did happen. Uh, she was from Arkansas and she said that she, as a little girl, saw a black man being hung from a tree, dead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's it's a very powerful thing. And then I've also had, I, I not only was I an art teacher at South Eugene High School, but I also so the freedom of being a substitute teacher. So sometimes I'd be in these classes in elementary schools and a kid would be acting out and, you know, and I, I, I took this one little girl who I knew was normally really pretty sweet natured and everything. And I said, Hey, I got, I would like you to draw me a picture of what's going on in your life and just everything that you can think of, just put it in there. And after I, math with these kids I'm going to come back and spend time with you so she got like about 30 minutes to do that and I came back and she just told me this incredible story of neglect and being ignored and and she showed you know like here's my parents every day after work they're locked up in the room playing video games mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry it's mm -hmm. not funny but you know, and so I was able to really kind of, she was able to get it all out. I also used to do a lot of psychodrama with the kids and have them act out. We would, they would do plays and, but that, that would go on forever. But I think that also art therapy uh, helped me when I, uh, you know, oh, after the UC Berkeley thing, I, I went into a bad slump and I didn't do any painting for like 12 years. Mm. And then I was really depressed and I had these, uh, my two oldest sons, David and Jonathan, I think they were three and five and we were sitting at the table with watercolors and, you know, colored pencils and ink pens and all that stuff. And we were just drawing and I was really depressed. And then I started noticing I was putting in color and I started, my mood started perking up and I thought, wow, maybe this is what I should be doing, you know, because it was such a, uh, and I just wanted to show you. So out of that, out of that, can you guys all, can you all see this? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, this, this little circus painting thing came out and I mean, does that look like a depressed person? No. Yeah, let's look a little bit higher. If you can look oh, up higher? a little bit higher. Yeah. Is there that? You go. Yeah. yeah. And bring it back a little bit closer to you. Oh, okay. Like that. Yep, that's yeah, that's good. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's beautiful. So yeah, colors. so it 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 kind of got me to start. You know, that's how I I oh, and Ellen Gapehart was my first watercolor teacher, who that was in 1986, and we've been best friends forever since since then. I mean, you know, she's just a remarkable. I don't know if you know who Ellen Gapehart is, but she's a remarkable arts person in our community. And um, and she she made it a, a lot of a lot of fun, like, a, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I'm grateful to all these wonderful teachers that I had. And but as Georgia O'Keefe said, the only person that can teach you how to paint it to, to paint your the way you're supposed to paint is yourself. You're the only mm -hmm. person who can teach you how to paint like you and I and I've always told my students that I tell them all these the the when I was teaching at uh, Churchill and South I taught them all the basics of you know painting values da, 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 and I said feel free to break all the rules but know mm -hmm. the rules you know mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I love hearing how this feeling of exclusion that you were feeling in your undergrad really translated into this um, practice of radical acceptance and, and the way that you have used art therapy to help people uh, re express and then radically process what is going on for them. Um, to use art as a medium of expression and not perfectionism or, or this specific, very particular way of pr provocation, that it's much more about the feeling of belonging and following instinct and responding to self and reaffirming self. There's a lot of really powerful things in there. And, you know, hearing your undergrad experience, there's nothing wrong with a lime green painting with orange line through it, right? That's a, that can be a really powerful artistic experience. Yeah. But it's a different form of expression from what we can see yeah. in your watercolors you're sharing today, you know. And so there's validity in both. And I think that's something we always need to remember in our arts community is we are made richer by the diversity of perspective. And right. it's, it's about you, the people who can harness these techniques in ways that open up different perspectives in us in a soft, natural, um, a, 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 a natural scene in a watercolor awaken something different in us than something that is bright and like <laughs> attacks us with very neon colors, right? That are so contrasting and, and there is there we grow from both of them. And so right. I love hearing how you come into the space of really this opening up and, and, and allowing others to really feel that ownership of whatever their expression is. That's really powerful yeah. to hear. Yeah. Well that's why Ralph Baker, who unfortunately died at early at the age of fifty five what I loved about his class, he, pardon? Oh, oh anyhow, no, but, but I, I took many classes from him. And what I loved his approach was, even though he himself was more of an abstract expressionist, mm -hmm. he encouraged all of us to be the best at whatever we were. Like one of us um, was a was a great, um, a real, a real are you, where are you, Eric? Oh, I'm still here, Eric. Can you not see oh. me? Oh, yeah. Well, you went black for a minute. Oh. But anyhow. Ralph encouraged the, the person who was like one of those super duper, you know, realistic, you know, perfect mm -hmm. realism. And then we had a couple of wild abstract painters. And then we had like me who was like, you know, more into the impressionism and surrealism. He encouraged all of us to be the best at what we did. He never tried to coach you to, oh, you should paint like this. I'm not going to mention names of other U of O. Oh, and Ron Graff, by the way, was also a great teacher. He taught me how to draw. There were uh, there was a lot of force in the department towards only one certain, like I was put down for, you know, you just, you just do pretty paintings. I mean, how disgusting can you get? Pretty paintings. Ugh. But I thought, why do I want to paint the garbage of the world and the ugliness and stuff when there's all this beauty surrounding us, you know? And I mean, I do see the value of painting the ugly and because we need to face all the, the terrible things that are going on in our world. Mm -hmm. But um, I tried to be that exact same kind of teacher that Ralph was to encourage my students to, to go in the direction where what, what, what they were attracted to. And I also was excited when they would branch out and loosen up a little bit and do something that was a little more free and, and wild. Like part of the watercolor techniques I taught were, were called wet and wild. And the kids just love that, you know, where you have the water, the papers mm -hmm. all soaking wet and you just throw all this color on and you just let it do what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. And they'd mm -hmm. say, let's do wet and wild, you know? <laughs> I love it. Well, we had a really great question come in from an audience member. So okay. Henry Alley out there asked, and I know that you and I kind of touched on this a tiny bit earlier, but I haven't actually gotten to hear much about this. So he asked, how does your fiction writing influence your painting? And how does your painting influence your writing? So in addition to painting, you're also a writer. So tell us a right. little bit about the relationship. There. Well, yeah, H H Hank and I have been working together for, for years, critiquing and stuff. Uh, I'd say that the how the painting uh, my the painting I think has helped me to in my writing to really describe visually so you can see and mm. feel and hear the the ocean and in my paintings I feel like I'm always making up a story you know it's like. I see, you know, just like maybe you had this when you were a kid and you still do it, but you know how you can see all these pictures in the sky and the clouds? Mm -hmm. To me, I can see a whole, sur I still do. I see all these things. So I think that they're, they're 
really very much related, although writing is, is one type of concentration and painting is a whole different one. But I don't know, Hank, I hope that sort of sort of answers the question. Yeah, well, thank you so much for, it sounds like Henry slash Hank, thank you so much for your, for your question. Um, it's really exciting to think about the multiple ways that we express ourselves as, as creatives, um, whether we identify as an artist or just somebody who dabbles in the different forms. And to hear that, you know, there is this expression that you also have in writing that awakens another part of you, right? And allows you to express a, new, a whole other realm of you. Well, I want to bring another question in. So there might be folks out there who have heard you describing your incredible adventures out there and doing plain air painting. And I know that you're a part of a plain air painting group. You mentioned earlier that you were just out with them painting the other day. Oh, no, I am a member. I am a yeah, member. Right, you are a member, right. Mm -hmm. So what tips do you have for folks who might be interested in trying out plain air painting? How did, how did you get into it and how would you suggest others give it a try? Well, I, I, I do, I do believe in books and looking up, you know, like the things that, that you'll need. I, I also do, if, if people can like take a class, you know, mm -hmm. but you, but I mean, like with Ralph Baker, he gave us the nuts and bolts and it was very simple. He told us what we needed to bring uh, what kind of paint, what kind of paper, and he, and instead of all the complications of an easel, which, you know, has its great advantages, uh, we sat on the ground and painted, mm -hmm. you know, and so we knew, we learned to bring, you know, have a pack that had water that, you know, where you got a lid on it, and all of those uh, details, um, anybody who wants to is welcome to come out with the plein air painters of Lane County. Uh, we've and we learn a lot from each other. I mean, like there was a new member, a new person today. It was her first time out with us, and she came over and was really interested in my easel and where did I get it and what kind was it. And of course, I didn't have answers to that because I don't really pay attention once I've gotten something. So, but mm -hmm. anyhow, people are welcome to. to uh, Plain Air is on Plain Air P, PPLC is on uh, Facebook, so you can find it. It's open to the public. Anybody who wants to come out and paint is welcome. And I just went ahead and dropped the link for that Facebook group right there in the comment section. So if anyone's curious, you can learn a little bit more about that crew right there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mara, I want to bring up another one of your paintings for us to be able to look at another example of your work. Um, sure. You've got to see a couple of different versions of water, but this is, these are a couple that uh, focus on the sky that I think is really lovely to see. So um, tell me a little bit about these paintings um, and maybe any little stories you have behind them. Well, um, this one right here, this is Kauai, and we go there. We have a timeshare in North Kauai, and this mm -hmm. is actually done right from our my the balcony, and I like it because it's it's a it's a it's a it's a much looser painting, and it just brings back wonderful uh, memories, and um, it's it's sold but I do have prints of it. And I, one of the things I do is, uh, I'm glad you brought up this one because I do go to different places and I paint there. So I have a lot of Kauai paintings, um, Mexico, um, Bolinas, of course, Clear Lake, uh, but the Kauai is a, a never ending discovery. For me, I mean, it's like the colors and the, and then just being there, even if you have a total disaster and a total flop, it doesn't matter because you're just surrounded by so much beauty. It's almost unbearable. Mm -hmm. And then this one, I'm really happy. This one I did, this is at the, um, this is at Fern Ridge. This is at the end of Royal, Royal Road. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I really took the time to do some careful sketching and I knew what I wanted to achieve I wanted to do so this is in the background those clouds that's atmospheric perspective so you see the big high value clouds that are big that are in the foreground and then as you go back recede the uh, there's lesser values and it gets fainter and fainter same thing with um, the linear perspective in um, in the front here you see more detailed stronger values and then it mm -hmm. it fades out but that was a really I mean, see, this is the thing. You, you can have so many miserable uh, results, and then all of a sudden, it's like the stars are aligned, and you just 
it all it just all flows and it works out perfectly but see to get there you have to be willing to plow through a lot of really bad paintings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to and to and to see some of the value in in them like <clears throat> Uh, oh, can you can you get to uh, lower? There's a um, my Yellowstone. It's uh, lower. Let's see. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yellowstone Springs. Oh yeah, right here. Yeah, the Yellowstone Springs. Um, that was the. So Willie, my husband and I, we took a, a wonder. 10 day trip to Yellowstone where we were doing eight, eight mile hikes every day. And I took a lot of photographs, uh, but it killed me that I couldn't paint. There just wasn't time. So I took a photographs and to do this one, the first one, because I was expecting it to be really bad. This is the first one. And I was Ooh. expecting it. To be bad, and I think it turned out pretty good, but I wasn't satisfied because it takes a lot to satisfy me. So I've done about six or seven more of them and they just got worse and worse and worse. And I think part of the reason this one came out well is because I was expecting it to just be bad mm. and just to get me kind of, you know, warmed up. So that's an you interesting. Latched into it. You let it, you let it kind of guide you versus trying to create something. It sounds like in those second ones, you put some yeah. pressure on yourself that might have limited. Yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's and so and same thing. Like when I, I used to teach adults, and in the spring we would go to Hendricks Park, you know, in May and June when the rhododendrons and azaleas are in bloom. So when I would do a demonstration for them, because I wasn't thinking about trying to do a good painting, just to sort of show them how you how you do it, how mm -hmm. fast, how slow you work. Some of my best paintings came from that because I was not mm -hmm. crippled with this anxiety. Oh my God, it's got to be a good painting, you know, mm -hmm. which can just be awful. And then this one is, I was um, wandering off um, the 804 trail and I came, I came upon this and then uh, I took photographs and then I came back one summer uh, when we were with the Eric Sandgren group in, and mm -hmm. uh, I went back in there and, and painted that and, and it's gone through a few evolutions, but um, oh, can we go back up? Go back up again. I wanted to. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here's this is wait here. Uh, this is Clear Lake, and the the thing that I love about Clear Lake is that the, there's so many different colors in the water. You know, it's pure. It's the head mm -hmm. of the Mackenzie River, mm -hmm. and there's no motorboats, and you can get all these incredible differences. And years ago, uh, I haven't done it for a while because it's so much physical work. I would call the um, the uh, forest rangers to find out when is the peak of fall at Clear Lake. Mm -hmm. And then uh, based on that, the very most powerful peak, and I, I, I haven't put, set those paintings up on the, on the web yet, the website. And I would go and stay in a modern cabin. You have to bring everything, all your own bedding, everything. And it's freezing cold. And But that was such a high experience. And I'd be mm. so cold, but I'd paint because you just got to paint through it. And then I'd come back into the, cot into the cabin, take me an hour to defrost, you know, and then I'd go back out to do the afternoon painting. But that, but anyhow, Clear Lake, I'm, I'm so excited that I get to go there. Um, and so yeah. hopefully there won't be another uh, holiday farm fire. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We'll be definitely all sending our, our prayers and hopes and energies to make sure that we have a very safe season this year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I clear like what a fortunate gift we have in our community that is so nearby and just like one of the most stunning natural environments oh. <laughs> anywhere. In Oregon, it's just, it's incredible. That, it, that it's, it's, it's just, it's mind boggling. And every time I, when I'm driving back from California to, to Oregon, as soon as I start getting into the mountains, I just feel this huge relief, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, like we, we, Willie and I moved here back in 1977. He got a full, um, he got a, an Oregon football scholarship and the plan was we were just going to stay for two years and then go back to our families. But we just got too mellow. We just mm. got too slowed down. <laughs> and um, it, it's been a really great, great place. Yeah. Well, we're running short on time, but we had another question come in from uh, Hank. So oh. uh, maybe we'll end with this question. 
Uh, do you not try to tell a story in your painting? Yes, I, I do. And I need, I do try to tell a story because I'm always making up stories in my head. Uh, because to me, the trees are all characters. And like lots of times I see the tree, like that's why I loved what, where I was painting today because the trees were just these amazing stories and they were like arched out like a ship over the, mm. over the river. And, um, and one, and then I, I should put this one up. It's a figure. I did do a painting in Rome of, uh, of, of, uh, this mysterious man going through, you know, right at the, um, the, you know, the, the St. Peter's, the whole, you know, where the, where the Pope pre, what's the name of that place again? You know, the big place everybody goes to. Any, pardon? Are you talking about the Vatican? Yeah, the Vatican. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Vatican. And it's a very mysterious painting. And I had a lot of fun painting mm -hmm. it and trying to wonder now, is that a priest going through there? Or is it somebody who's up to no good? What what's the story? And hoping that people that in fact my uh, my neighbors who did all this cat care, I gave them a choice of they could take three prints for my thank you, and they chose that one, and I was so pleased. I can't wait to go over there and and see it see it uh, framed and hung up and all that. Yeah, well, yeah. No, I. I, have, I, I mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I just because we're close on time, I have one final closing question that I ask all of the artists that are on the live stream happy hour. Mara, where are you finding inspiration right now? Well, I'm I, I, always in nature, but I've been recently looking back at old uh, collections I have of the uh, the Beijing massacre at Tiananmen Square. Mm. I was very I was an activist in that. I was like the only mm. white person working with all the Chinese students and silk screening. You know that big picture of the man with the tank stopping the mm. tank. Mm. Uh, we we channeled thousands and thousands of dollars from selling them at Saturday Market to the democracy movement. And now I've gotten out the, the, the folder and I would like to start doing paintings of that because I kept, I just was looking at them. They're just amazing photographs. Do you remember that in 1989? What was it, June 5th, June 6th? And then I've also got a folder of all the Black Lives Matter and all the, the smoke bombs and everything in Portland. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about doing some paintings based on that too. Just you know, because I am a, I am, I am an off and on social activist. I'm kind of got worn out by the whole thing, but I'm ready to. That's what I'm thinking about tackling. And also because I have to have more on my plate than I can possibly do, I really want to go to the Grand Tetons and just paint. We, I just that place just blew my mind. But I need a, at least two, three other people to be there because you know I don't want to get eaten by a grizzly bear. Yeah, that makes sense. That is a good thing to make sure you avoid in the process. Well, Mara, it sounds like you have so many things going on. You are filled with inspiration and that you are surrounded. You put yourself in so many spaces of inspiration. So thank you for sharing a little bit of your process with us today and sharing some of your art. Um, and congratulations on the new website that just got posted. I know that that is new, that that's officially out there. So everyone should definitely make sure you go check it out. Um, okay. Any final words or any like final plugs that you want to put out there? Thank, thank you for being so wonderful, Eric. And thank you for all that you do for all of us artists in Lane, Lane Art in, in, in Lane County. It's really valuable. And everybody, he's going to be in a play in August. <laughs> this is about you, not about me. Come on now. Well, yeah, all right. Well, anyhow, you're, you're a very versatile artist, too. Oh, so. Well, thank you, Mara. I really appreciate that. It's, it's so kind of you to say, and, and it's so much fun to learn, and I grow so much from these conversations. So thank you for all your wisdom today. It's clear that teachers have been a very important part of your life, and as somebody who's very passionate about arts education, thank you for all the teaching that you've done in our community as well. And I know that there are people out there who look to you as the inspirations of so many other names that you dropped today. Oh, so all y'all, yeah, absolutely. For all y'all who have tuned in, we will be taking a break from the live stream happy hour next week just to be able to make sure we have a little bit of time to be able to just breathe in between. But we will be back with more artists through the whole summer. So please stick around and definitely join us for a future week. We're so excited to keep bringing artists your way. And if you have any recommendations for artists you'd like to see on the happy hour, feel free to email us at laneart at laneart.org. Or if you are an artist that might be interested in being featured, again, email us at laneart at lanearts.org, and we'll be very excited to get you on here. That's how Mara got on here, so it works. Reach out. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you again soon. Okay, bye.